Okay, good to go. All right, so I guess I will get started, even though maybe some students will come maybe uh, a little bit late. But well, today's lecture probably will be somehow related to some problem that you 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 see in engineer applications, but you don't see very often in optimization textbook. And it's called the stochastic optimization. And this topic is interesting because <coughs> it's slightly different from what you learned in just a pure mathematical optimization. It has something, it has some connection to real engineering applications. And I will try to explain to you what's the difference and in general how the standard optimization idea can be applicable to this situation. What kind of improvement you would expect to see from that, from that uncertainty of both objective function and also maybe the, the algorithm you're going to deploy to optimize your objective function. So let's first look at standard problem decode the fundamental optimization problems of interest. Okay, so in general, you can say we want to optimize some objective function with respect to certain decision variable. And in engineering context, we call that parameter vector theta, which takes some domain, this capital theta, as it's basically its parameter space. And here, this vector theta represents some adjustables where it can be continuous variable, can be discrete variable. It can be both continuous and discrete in its elements. Okay, so there are two fundamental problems of interest in this particular case. One is, of course, the direct optimization problem. You can say, I want to find the value of some vector theta belongs to its parameter space that minimizes some scalar objective function with in the engineering context, we call that the loss function of some problem where this loss may be associated with your estimation error or decision error or maybe some other risk, risk associated with the action you are going to take to do something like the control or maybe some other adaptive mechanism in order to achieve certain performance metrics. Another related problem of course, is to find some value theta in the parameter space that solves the equation g of theta equals to zero. And remember, this g is, in general, simultaneous equations of vector theta. So we could use, of course, the derivative or the gradient of the objective function with respect to your parameter theta and set that to zero, which is considered the necessary condition to find the stationary point of the optimal solution. However, that's not necessarily always the case. But in general, we have two type of problem. One is just try to find the minimal value of objective function. The other is find the rule of some vector value <coughs> equation g of theta equals to zero. We want to find the root. Okay, and now let's look at the objective function, and in this case, we call that a loss function because it's some performance measure we want to minimize in terms of the loss. Of course, typically we encounter the optimization problem where the decision variables are continuous, and in this case, the objective function is continuous, okay? Alternatively, we may have objective function which contains both continuous decision variable and discrete decision variable. So it's discrete and continuous. In this particular case, along this axis, you have continuous decision variable. Along this axis, you have discrete decision variable. And finally, you can have all these parameters only taking discrete values. So in that case, finding the minimum value would be a difficult problem unless you can avoid exhaustively enumerate all the possible values. Okay, with that being said, this is what? Basically, 
standard mathematical optimization problem we are talking about up to now, up to today. So what about the, op the optimization technique that we learned? Of course, we started with what? Unconstrained optimization problem. We say if you want to minimize some continuous or maybe even differentiable loss function L of theta subject to theta with some constraints. Let's say without the constraint, what you want to do is just to set the derivative partial L partial theta to zero and try to find the minimum by checking this stationary point. On the other hand, this <coughs> may require you to do a lot of <coughs> effort analytically to either find the root or maybe numerically try to find the root value for this. Okay? And that is mainly for unconstrained optimization. For constrained optimization, of course, we introduce so-called Lagrangian multipliers for both equality and inequality constraints. And then we basically then repeat this type of procedure, checking the stationary point, and then check validate so-called active or inactive constraints by checking these coin tucker conditions. Okay, so now let's think about stochastic setting for this optimization problem. And in some engineering context, people call that stochastic search, and some people call just stochastic optimization. And the difference is that whenever you want to assess this loss function, you cannot get your measurement precisely, meaning that the random noise may come into your measurement, which we call that y of theta, which is your true loss function L of theta plus some noise. Occasionally, you may also have artificially injected randomness due to Monte Carlo design of your algorithm in your choice of the iteration magnitude or the search direction. I remember when we talk about optimization algorithm, so far we basically designed the algorithm based on some deterministic procedure. Either we find the gradient direction and then go to the deepest descent, or we try to maybe not go directly through the deepest descent direction, but through so-called conjugate gradient or maybe quasi Newton approximation to some objective function where maybe local quadratic interpolation would be better than just go for gradient directions. And those are deterministic algorithms. Yes? Uh, the random walk that we did for homework, uh, yeah. a part of stochastic optimization? Uh, I would say so. And in, in fact, you could also have so-called global meta heuristic algorithms like simulated annealing and genetic algorithms, which are also based on some kind of random mechanism to perturb your search direction. And that, you can say, can be considered as some kind of stochastic type of algorithm. But that doesn't really solve stochastic optimization problem. The difference is that in this particular case, we don't have accurate way of getting the loss function. So what can we do? Well, think about, in contrast to deterministic method, for instance, like the deepest descent algorithm to get to the local minimum, or use the newton raphson method to find the root, in this particular case, one realization of this loss function may not really tell you a lot unless you have very good realization because each time you may observe the loss function in a very noisy setting. And in that case, we have to think about what algorithm would be particularly good for that kind of situation. In addition, <coughs> you may realize that sometimes by injecting some randomness into your search algorithm, so the performance could be improved especially when you have an objective function where you are afraid of getting into local minimum. You want to use some kind of perturbation to at least shake it out. 
so that there's a hope you can get to the global optimal. And that's why, for instance, simulated annealing and genetic algorithm all take the advantage of that, of that random perturbation, even though a pure random search may not be as efficient as some meter heuristic random search. But with that being said, of course, we need to look into the situation where we want to have stochastic optimization technique that can handle the real situation. And in this simplified example, you can see that this solid curve shows some kind of smooth objective function where the true minimal is at this particular location, theta star. However, what you actually observe would be this red, very nosy curve. If you directly find the minimum of this y of theta, you end up with this false minimum that's significantly different from the true minimum. Okay, so that's the situation in stochastic setting where you don't have a reliable way to assess your objective function. So what do you do? Uh, well, let's assume I do, then what? Let's assume the noise is additive Gaussian. Would I want to apply some type of smoothing filter to my noisy data? Uh, David, can you repeat that? Would I want to apply some type of smoothing filter to the noisy data? Okay, so I think that's a good suggestion. You want to smooth out this observation by somehow r remove the noise to the best extent, right? Also, now also suggests that probably we want to do that. But how can we really do that? Let's look at a particular example where, for instance, we say <coughs> we want to track some desi desired reference signal. And this tracking problem where you have a way to control basically how the system should behave depending on your design parameter theta. For instance, you can say this theta could be like the pose of your meso guidance or maybe the robot arm manipulation, or maybe attaining some macroeconomic target values in order to stabilize the financial system. Basically, you have some system model, and then you want to pick a particular value theta that minimize some kind of error measure with respect to so-called the mean square error. And this mean square error, basically, you can say it's like in, on the average how well you behave, depending on, on the average, this expectation with respect to the, the actual output you have and the desired output. You want this difference to be as small as possible in the mean square error sense. And in general, you may say the noise, you don't know the distribution. It can be non-Gaussian. And also the system function is not a linear function. It can be highly non-linear. And also, you cannot directly assess the true loss function L of theta. So how do you pick the theta that minimize this mean square error? Then what you have, of course, is the observed value, some kind of squared error metric, for instance. Then you observe this squared error. And then what do you do? Of course, this squared error represents the true loss plus some noise. And this value of y of theta, not this l of theta, is in general used to do the optimization. And that's like, of course, some kind of smoothing by taking the average of your loss. But then, of course, an interesting question is, does that work? Because of the noise, that actually makes your measurement of the loss very unreliable in each case. 
So how can you really make sure that using wave theta instead of error theta, you can minimize this and get the correct answer with respect to the minimum solution of theta? Then, of course, you need to have a way to simulate this real system by some kind of Monte Carlo simulations. And also, this parameter theta in, the, in your simulation, in general, should have some physical meaning so that you can actually use the result to apply to the real engineering domain as your optimized solution. For, for instance, this theta could be machine locations in some plant layout. It could be some timing parameters in air traffic control can be resource allocation mechanism in military operations. And what you want to do is to run some simulation in order to determine what would be the best value of theta for real system. On the other hand, you don't have a direct way to assess this loss function. What you need to do is just to minimize the average measure of your performance with respect to your loss function. And sometimes, this value theta only represent one realization of your loss function, meaning that this value theta is this L of theta plus some noise, OK? So what can you do? In general, stochastic optimization requires you to build some inherent me mechanism where you have the input, and then what? You can simulate the system to get some noisy observation of your loss function, which I call y of theta. And then you run your stochastic optimization algorithm in order to pick some value of theta. And this theta could be used to generate another realization of the system. You get another noisy observation. And what? You keep doing that until you believe that this y of theta, on average, would behave like what? The, your, your true loss function. Then eventually, there's a hope that after you do the optimization, you are really optimizing this loss function with respect to your best solution in the minimum. OK, so of course, a relevant theoretical question to ask, is that possible at all? I think the idea is simple, right? You try to simulate the system, and then you try to use the average to reduce the noise effect when you cannot directly assess the loss function, that the objective function you want to minimize. So you can say, on average, I'm getting there, my objective function, so eventually I'm optimizing the true objective function, close to the true objective function. But would that be really possible? Yes. When you run the simulation, are you assuming that noise is automatically added to the simulation? Well, you can simulate by, for instance, adding artificial noise to the system. And sometimes you may say, if I want to design this system, I can just use the system, the existing system on my, in itself, which is considered already noisy observations. For instance, when you try to collect sensor readings from, from a plant, and then you try to find the best resource allocation scheme based on your sensor readings, your sensor reading itself is already noisy. And then, of course, you can keep collecting more data, try to reduce the noisy part as much as you can. And this idea still should follow. On the other hand, of course, we just assume that by doing this, eventually we can get rid of this noisy effect. But of course, a fundamental theoretical question is whether that's possible at all. No? OK. Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay, yeah, I agree with you that we cannot get rid of the noise, but is it possible, for instance, by doing this, because originally we cannot directly observe the objective function, but now we just say smoothing out and take the average as a performance metric and still try to optimize that new objective function and get the optimal solution. And there's a hope this is just the optimal solution we want to find for the original last function where we want to find the minimal, even though that function, we don't have any direct way to get the measurement. How, how do you set up the number of uh, samples? Well, you can keep doing that, but then theoretically, you can say as you try long enough, is it possible eventually you are getting the correct optimal solution with respect to the true last function? Yes. The, you're assuming noise is small and it's distributed all over the place. Okay. And so the more samples you do uh, for a particular point, you might have noise from one sample, but for another sample, you might have true value. Okay. And as you go along and you average them over a particular point, uh, the effect of noise is reduced. So that's why we. Yeah, of course, you are reducing the effect of the noise by doing the average, but if the, would that be enough? for you to optimize the noisy last, fu last function to eventually get to the minimum solution? And that's like a very difficult theoretical question to, to answer, I would say. And we can maybe change the problem from a different aspect. Suppose that we say there are n theta different possible values for u decision variable theta. And let's say we have nL. These are the different number of values of u last function. OK, so overall, you can say because for each particular value of your last function, you can take n theta different parameter values. So overall, you have nL to the power of n theta number of configurations you have to consider in order to find which one really is the minimal with respect to a particular configuration of your last function. And there is, of course, a finite but possibly huge number of last functions you have to think about. And within this, of course, you may hope that maybe one particular theta that actually optimizes all these last functions so that even though you, you have the noisy version of that, it doesn't really matter. Eventually, you can get to the true optimal even though it, it's been perturbed by noise. On the other hand, there's a fundamental theorem called the low no fear lunch theorem tells you otherwise, meaning that if you only consider the average performance over all loss functions, then what? Then in effect, there's no hope that you can find the one algorithm that works for all possible configurations. Meaning that if you have one type of noise perturb the loss function that eventually you can get to it, there, there are cases where you have some loss function you cannot get it by doing this average. Okay, so to make it intuitively understandable, we have to illustrate what it means by saying this important so-called no free lunch theorem, which actually was proposed by <coughs> two computer theorists talking about the comparing among different computer algorithms, which one is uniformly better than other type of algorithm. And originally they thought that, for instance, they want to find a particular optimization algorithm that works better than others with some definite performance improvement. 
And when the, whenever they try to set a reasonable objective function, then eventually they find out if this algorithm works better than other, than other algorithms in some cases, then in other cases, the algorithm will perform worse. Meaning that somehow if you can do better in this course, intuitively I would say maybe you will do something worse in other courses. There are some courses, there are some instances you, you are guaranteed to do to perform worse. Basically that's the intuitive interpretation of this so-called no free lunch theorem. In this particular example, there are three possible values, theta one, theta two, and theta three. And let's say there are two outcomes from no z free loss function L. And there are eight possible mappings. Hence, we can say there are eight different optimization problems. Here, mappings are numbered one through eight, and here theta one, theta two, theta three. And then these mappings indicate the mean loss across all problems. Let's say, assuming that the mean value is the same regardless of this value of theta. Meaning what? In some cases, two means better than one, right? In some cases, theta one might be better in these four different cases, but not as not as good in other four cases. Same thing for theta, for using theta two and theta three. And these entries one and two in this table just represent possible outcomes of your loss function. Okay, so from this entry, basically what can we conclude? If you can do well in some configurations, then you cannot do very well in other configurations. Because what? Let's assume that they all have the mean value identical to 1.5, okay? Then if you tell me there are cases I can perform two, then what? I can tell you there, there, should, there should be cases where you perform below 1.5 for sure. Does that intuitively make sense? Okay, so then, then what? Then basically these two computer theorists extend this idea to more abstract setting, saying that, for instance, if you think about any optimization problem where you try to set a performance metric and try to compare different algorithms, assume that algorithm A is applied to this loss function, and then let's assume that you use n unique function evaluation to this loss function, and then you get n different values. And let's assume that the probability that this value is some nominal value you, you would like to see, let's call lambda, given you apply algorithm A to this loss function L. And when you evaluate n different values, one of these would be equal to lambda. And then, of course, this no free lunch theorems just consider how this probability for choices of your algorithm A and loss function L would, uh, would compare with another algorithm B. And now you already see the intuitive explanation of the answer, which says, well, this is like without any mathematical equation, the engineering interpretation of no free lunch theorem. On average, over all possible problems, or you can say all possible outcomes of your loss function L, all algorithms will perform equally well. Which means what? If you consider all the possible noise perturbed configurations, if you say I can work well for this particular configuration, then I will tell you no, you cannot work very well on other configurations. And this apply to what? Any algorithm, no matter how smart you are, no matter how dumb you propose your algorithm. 
they all behave the same on average. Is that a surprising result? No? So I think Mr. Yu Liu will probably say, well, I, I've seen this before, right? <laughs> but not that surprising. OK. At the very beginning, I thought, wow, that's very surprising to me. But it's very pessimistic somehow, meaning that there's no hope you try to invent like a brilliant algorithm that out outperform others because they say, well, if you consider computer algorithm for generic Lux function, I, uh, assume you assess the average performance, they all behave the same. So what's the point? And in particular, if you say algorithm one performs better than algorithm two over some problems, then there should be other set of problems where algorithm two can outperform algorithm one. And overall, the relative efficiency of two algorithms cannot be inferred by what? By just sampling from these noisy observations. So what's the implication of this? I would say, originally, I asked a very important theoretical question. Is there any hope that, for instance, if you don't have accurate reading of the loss function by just looking at the samples, eventually you can get to what? You can find design algorithm to find the optimal of the original loss function somehow and perform the best, some, in quote. And then no, no free lunch theorem says that this probably is very unlikely to happen unless what? You specify a particular problem and only focus on a specific set of your interest. If you talk about anything, this says if you don't specify a particular algorithm, if you don't specify a particular problem, then what? Every algorithm looks the same on average over the whole problem set. Does that make sense? Well, if you, for instance, if you only care about one instance, then that's fine. For instance, I want to find, like, as an analogy, who will be the best in optimization class. Of course, I can design a particular performance metric just to care about this. But then this is mainly about, for instance, if you say some student can do very well in optimization, then comparably, maybe other students can do better in other courses. If you don't limit your problem set, if you make it very general. Basically, that's the analogy. And that doesn't say anything about how we can solve stochastic optimization. It just says at the top level, you probably shouldn't expect your algorithm to work brilliantly that solve all the stochastic optimization problem. OK? And with that being said, then basically what can we do for stochastic optimization? Well, we can borrow the idea from what? From the optimization techniques that you learned before to this particular context. For instance, I would say the most naive optimization technique that you probably would, would conclude from the computer assignment would, is what? Random search, right? Which doesn't require any gradient direction whatsoever and doesn't require your objective function to be continuous or discrete. Or basically, you just try randomly explore around among your feasible sets, OK? And of course, this may not work as efficient as some well-designed optimization algorithms. But still, it's considered one possible optimization technique to consider. So now let's talk about how to extend random search algorithm to the nosy loss function measurements. 
And the basic implementation of random search assumes you have perfect evaluation of this last function so that you can know this time theta one is better than theta two because the last function is smaller. But in the noisy setting, what, what will happen? Because of noise, you cannot say for sure. So some, sometimes you may say, in the application, you only observe Y, you don't observe L. Then you cannot say for sure. So what do you do? Well, I think the simplest modification is just to take some type of average over your observation so that you'll say maybe by doing this average, you reduce the effect of noise. And then what? Each, each time you determine this y to be an approximation of this l, and then you can basically choose which one is better. And then you randomly explore. Okay, so there's also another alternative modification to this. You may say, well, if I already searched one particular value theta one, I want to search for theta two. Let's say L theta two, if it's not significantly smaller than L of theta one, then I should not accept. I set some threshold tau greater than zero for the improvement before the new value is accepted by the algorithm. And this thresholding in this random search works whenever you observe a value is significantly smaller than you change your new estimate to that. Otherwise, you keep it to the old value. Okay. And um, what do you expect about the performance for this? takes a long time to do the average, I agree. And what? Even when you take the average, it may not be that reliable because you cannot completely get rid of the noise. So in general, it has very limited convergence in the noisy setting, even though maybe you have small amount of noise. And remember, without noise, random search is already considered what? A very slow algorithm in doing the optimization. You compared that for the computer assignment, which is I like optimization with two decision variables, I assume, right? And then random search takes about 10, over 10,000 steps to get to the performance close to the stop criterion where you use f-min search, which is considered an efficient simplex method, right? I think some of you probably run into a, like lucky cases where maybe 5,000 iterations, you already run, get some good random search result. I don't know. But I think on average, you observe like maybe more than 10,000 iterations in random search. So <coughs> that's not really a good way to do this. OK, so any possible improvement, of course, one way you can think about is that, for instance, let's say I know the approximate gradient direction. But unfortunately, I cannot directly solve, set the gradient equal to zero because I don't have a way to directly measure the loss function. Or maybe the gradient accurately assess the gradient function in each particular value. So now let's focus on this problem. How do I find the root for some function g of theta equals to zero? And in this case, let's assume that we cannot directly assess this g function. Of course, sometimes it's a nonlinear function, so you cannot directly solve g of theta equals to zero. And you only observe y usually over time, k equals to zero, one, two, and so on. And this is g of theta plus some noise, e k of theta. And this problem arises frequently in engineering optimization problem because your optimization is with respect to some noisy measurements represent 
some gradient of the loss function, but you don't know <coughs> exactly what would be the value of g of theta. And this could include a quantile type problems and equation solving in physics based models and many machine learning problems where the realizations of you training data doesn't represent the true statistical model with unknown parameter you're going to estimate. So these are typical problems where you need to find the root with unreliable observation. So instead of solving g of theta equals to zero, you may say, well, how about I just solve y of theta equals to zero, but that's not reliable because of this noise. So what can we do? And in general, we have to find a sequential update method whenever you have a new observation yk, you try to improve your existing estimate of your value theta of k so that eventually g of theta is close to zero, okay? And this requires you to, what, update from some existing value theta of k to a new value theta of k plus one. And now, this is stochastic because what? This yk is your g of theta k plus some noise. So that part is random, which means this whole sequence in general is a random sequence. And we want to know if it will converge eventually to the true value theta star, which gives you g of theta star equals to zero, okay? With this being said, then in general, it is a total waste to average over all the measurements for any particular given value of theta. So you in, in effect, you do the average across iterations by changing the value of theta. And now, if you <coughs> look at this update equation, you may say, wow, I can, I can invent that, right? And this is so-called the Robbins-Monroe algorithm which is very famous in so-called stochastic gradient update. And that can be applied to many different situations. And it's just the old estimate with the change of difference from what? This y supposed to be what? like the gradient of your loss function. So essentially, when this part is zero, then what? You don't change this, right? If, if this is, is if without noise, let's think about, if this is g of theta, if, that's, if, theta, if, theta, if theta can make this thing zero, then what? You shouldn't change that, right? So this, f, <coughs> this a of k is a stat size, which means later, what? This part, will be close to what? The true value where g of theta is close to zero, right? Even though each time it's noisy. But then this later, this change should be small. So what I'm saying is your step size should be what? Somehow diminishing. Eventually, when theta k is close to theta k plus one, then you, you stop. And the whole idea is that this, of course, is a noisy observation of you true g function, g of theta. But then by doing this average, this is like a weighted value of your observation, right? By doing that, eventually this part will be close to g. And also this value will be changed according to what? Somehow close to approximate a gradient direction. Make sense? Even though this is a very, very simple iterative equation, it incorporates all these nice thinking, nice thing about stochastic optimization. Question, yes. Very good question, what do you think? Okay. Well, in this case, we 
we don't have any good way to say what would be the optimal value of A of K. Why? Because each time it's just a noisy realization. We can only say on average, this whole sequence A of K should be diminishing, right? On the other hand, it cannot decay too fast. Why? Because remember each observation YK is noisy representation of G. You need to have adequate weight, weighted average so that this Y of K eventually will approach to G, right? On the other hand, if you decay too slow, then what that means this update for theta would go very long time. So this essentially is what? It's what we call exploration, exploitation dilemma. In the random setting, you want to explore, but you need to what? Also keep this part decay reasonably fast. So I'm going to get into that just in a few slides. So the gain selection is very critical to the performance of any stochastic optimization algorithm. And this sequence, we talk about this sequence A of K because each time it's random. So we cannot say for a particular time K, what's the optimal value, doesn't make sense. We have to say on average how this sequence should behave. Um, there's this so-called famous co convergence conditions ex established by Robbins and Monroe. Because by just proposing that iterative update, it doesn't really deserve a land, like a groundbreaking paper on stochastic optimization. In fact, they prove that if you choose this AK sequence, the step size, essentially the sum of this sequence approach to infinity, but the square of that it's finite. And if they say if you satisfy this, then the stochastic <coughs> optimization algorithm will converge eventually to the true value, G of theta star. That theta star, that G of theta star is zero. And a common practical choice would be something like this. You'll say my A of K is some value A over k plus one plus a raised to the power of alpha. And this alpha is between 0 0.5 to one. If you think about a sequence one over n, one over k should satisfy this condition, right? The sum one over k is of infinity, sum one over k square is finite. Should, should, should work, so, so that's why you have some choices like this alpha. Okay, this is like k to the power of alpha, and then you have some tuning parameter on this a to say relatively first step how large the step size should be, and also this a. And this a, some people call stability constant, allows for larger steps in the early stage, if you think about in, at the very beginning you need to take some average over your noisy observation to remove the noise. But sometimes this could also be very tempting because you also update your estimated value of theta significantly. So this larger step probably can lead to fast convergence, but only in the early iterations. It may not risk any behavior later when this alpha kicks in and k increases. And this alpha and a can usually be pre-specified before you design the, the algorithm. But this value A in the numerator is basically problem dependent. Sometimes you say it's trial and error process. You fine tune one parameter and try to find what would be the best value for your application and that's it. Okay, so now we settle with this very famous Robbins and Monroe algorithm and then we say in general if this g is actually the gradient function of your loss, even though this l of theta you cannot measure directly, so you cannot also directly measure g of theta. But still, you can think about stochastic gradient method is nothing but approximate root finding by Robbins Monroe iteration, iterative algorithm, right? Suppose we cannot observe L of theta or G of theta except in the presence of noise. And this could be true in adaptive control, target tracking, 
simulation-based optimization or experimental design. A lot of engineer applications where you optimization problem can only be formulated in such a way. Uh, what can we do? Well, we don't know G, right? But we have to use the observation, not directly, but try to construct what? So-called the unbiased estimate of this gradient direction, partial L, partial theta, for the optimization. And then you can apply this so-called Robbins-Monroe iterative algorithm, which is called the stochastic gradient method in most standard textbook talking about this. So anyone knows what unbiased estimate is? <laughs> Only Mr. Yu Liu took the, took the estimation theory course. And resting, okay. So what does that mean? Well, <coughs> if you, in general, if you have some value of theta you want to estimate, right? How do you estimate that? You need some observation, which you can say this observation is related from theta, right? And then basically you try to construct what you call the estimate theta hat as a function of your observation, right? And how do you really achieve that? You need to say, well, this is my estimate, which is usually random because this observation can be quite noisy, right? Unbiased means what? On average, on average, this is actually the true value of theta, no matter what value of theta takes. For example, if theta can take zero or one, no matter which value you take, this, on average, I can say the expected value of this has to be equal to what? Theta, okay. Why this is important? Why this is important? Remember when we talk about when we talked about the stochastic gradient, we use what? Somehow like taking the average of the weighted average of the noisy observations, right? Use that to represent what the true the true loss of the true gradient function which we cannot have any access to. No matter what value it takes, if you estimate is biased, what will happen? That will bias the whole estimate toward what, whatever the bias value you have, right? So that's why this unbiasedness requirement is crucial when you try to reconstruct your gradient, approximate stochastic, approximate gradient direction using noisy measurements. So that's why it's called a stochastic gradient. Okay, so suppose your loss function is actually the average of some observed cost, where, for instance, this V represents all the random effect with respect to some unknown parameter theta, and then this Q function represents the noisy measurement of your loss function then this average, on average, we would hope that there's no bias toward the construction of this L. And seeking a representation for this gradient that is unbiased is in general not easy because this may not be true when the distribution V depends on your unknown parameter theta. Well, to make it mathematically rigorous, you can see that this expectation is actually 
taking the average with respect to the noisy effect due to your observed Q instead of L directly. So this noisy effect is taking the average with respect to all this possible outcome Q, okay? But let's say if this depends on theta, then what will happen? This average should be what? With respect to a conditional distribution on theta, which we don't have any access to because we don't know theta to begin with. So this density function, if it depends on theta, then this wouldn't work anyway. But of course, if you cannot see the difference between these two lines of mathematical equations, then I would suggest maybe you should take 6533, which I think most of you took that if you're engineering graduate student, electrical engineering graduate student, right? That which is probability and stochastic processes, where basically you need to understand the condition, the difference between the conditional expectation and the unconditional expectation. Of course, to gain better understanding on this one, you could also take so-called estimation and common filtering, which is 6537, I believe. And that, that's also very useful to understand about how to estimate a pra no parameter from the noisy observations. Okay, so with that being said, we have this so-called stochastic gradient algorithm. And now, <coughs> in general, what do we do? When this density function happens to be independent of theta, meaning that the noise effect can be separated, then what? Then you're lucky. You should be happy about that. Then this Q function, which is direct observation of, of theta with noise, then you can take the gradient with respect to theta and you get this Y. And that's actually unbiased measure. We call that unbiased measurement of the, of the gradient direction, which is partial L, partial theta. And of course, this requires some mathematical manipulation to be valid. Sorry about the typo. And this basically requires the derivative integral to be interchangeable, meaning that you take the expected value for this <coughs> and then take the derivative and then you take the expected value of this partial derivative on average, they are interchangeable. In general, this is not true. But why this, there's a hope that this is valid. I'm sorry? By continuous with respect to what? You mean with respect to theta? Is that the only requirement for the interchange between the derivative and expectation? Think so? Well, now you're not so sure because because you don't see other students concur with your yes. argument. Yeah, of course it is, and that we can safely assume, assume that in general. But what else? Nothing else. Well, think about that. With this being said, assume this is true, then what? Then everything boils down to using the well-known root finding algorithm, Robbins-Monroe iteration, to find theta, where this y is based on calculating what? The derivative with respect to theta, but based on observation, noisy observation instead of 
unknown loss function. And this is if it is actually unbiased measurement, then basically we can show that this also satisfies so-called key convergence equation conditions of the famous Robbins Monroe algorithm. Basically we follow the same convergence analysis technique developed by Robbins and Monroe, saying that if this AK sequence decays to zero, not too fast, meaning that the sum of this AK should be what? Infinity, but the sum of this AK square should be finite, then it will converge. Any questions? Okay, so let's take a short break. After that, I hope that I can provide one or two examples to show you why this stochastic gradient algorithm is actually also very useful in engineering applications. Why are you asking? Because I'm trying to add this. Is okay, so what would be the requirement for that? I have to take an uh, independent time to make it. Then you can take that with Dr. Bushwa, I assume. I'm taking my thesis with him. Yeah, but what I'm saying is you could ask Dr. Bushwa to see if she can offer you independent study during the summer if you are very desperate to graduate. Well, I, are you asking me to be on your thesis committee, or that's? Okay, so I mean, if that that's a different issue, then we can discuss about that later. But basically, I'm not going to offer any course in summer. So, so if you look for independent study, I would say maybe talk with Dr. Bushra is the, the best choice. Okay, sure. I'm sorry? Is it always true? You think so? Not always. I mean, it's not obviously always true, but it seems like it should be true in a lot of cases. Yeah, okay, so Leafy already add one condition saying that the, yeah, well, the, the, yeah, that's just, but that's like some kind of regularity assumption for the probability distribution, meaning that the, basically the noise is a continuous variable. That, that I can accept that, sure, but yeah, that, that's so not, I was, I was assuming it anyway. yeah, but that, that's not a really the critical condition for the interchange between derivative and integral. But then think about that. <laughs> Well, I think for those who didn't take uh, probability stochastic processing course, I probably wouldn't ask that because they they have to struggle on the basic definition first before getting into such a question. But I agree that in most engineering applications, like people don't care, say let's assume this is doable, yeah. right? At least it's not a surprise. If but if you say I cannot change, that's a surprise, right? If if you yeah. say well in my problem I cannot switch between the integral between the integral and derivative, then that's a surprise. And that you have to find some concrete counter example to say no in that case I cannot. Also, finding unbiased estimate is hard. In some cases, you'll say, well, I know it is not really unbiased estimate, but I will use stochastic gradient direction anyway. Anything that's not biased doesn't converge, though, right? Oh, uh, well, it's hard. I, maybe like you, yeah, like you have to prove that even though this is a biased gradient direction, but still I can prove it will converge anyway. 
And sometimes people say, for this problem, adding some bars is beneficial because it can convert even faster. Yeah, so it's, that, that's, that's because if you can design a good bias, I think in estimation theory, did you know that, for instance, by in order just to reduce the mi mean square error, a biased estimate could be uniformly better than an uh, unbiased estimate. Right. I remember you can, you can add some bias to reduce variance. So yeah. 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 So, 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 you, so you learned that? OK. I've heard it. Yeah. OK. Yeah, yeah that, that, that's very important trade-off. For instance, if you say a bias can significantly reduce the variance uniformly, no matter what unknown value, data value you take, then that means this bias dominance in terms of the mean square error criteria. Then you say, I'm the best unbiased estimate, meaning that among those unbiased estimates, you have the minimal variance, right? And then I can say mine is better by just introducing some bias. And that's very, re I think that's like a very recent theoretical result, saying that this could happen, yeah. Because like no matter what value in your parameter space, a bias can be designed uniformly dominant, a uniformly, how should I say, minimum variance on bias estimate. Because in general, when you do an estimation problem for parameter, if you can find a minimum variance on bias estimate, you should be happy about that, right? And then I say no. If you care about just minimize the mean square error, then by introducing bias, you can uniformly beat that minimal variance on bias estimate. Right. Yeah. In if some problem, if yeah. You're also, if you're designing the bias, then you can subtract the bias off to get and there. In most cases, you cannot. Because there's no uniform bias that can be that, but right. there are cases you can. Mm -hmm. And that's very surprising because, because of that, then for instance, the estimation theory usually, the emphasis is not really on the, the, on the unbiasedness. Like in, in my philosophy, I wouldn't care about whether your, your estimate is unbiased or not, unless that's really one important performance metric to the real problem. And sometimes if you say that's, yeah, if yeah. that's not really crucial, then yeah. if you can reduce variance, then make some trade off. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, like if you have a robot who can either go this way with this much variance, yeah. which is the true direction, or it can yeah. go slightly off with much less variance. Yeah. Sometimes it's better to, better to take the minimum variance even though it's a little off. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, that, that depends on the problem. Yeah. Yeah, and that's important even mm -hmm. even for this stochastic gradient algorithm. <laughs> like a lot of reason development, especially under so-called reinforcement learning context, is mainly about how to really create a better bias to reduce so-called exploration stage that you can easily enter into this exploitation stage. And that will be very efficient. But on the other hand, because of this so-called no free lunch theorem, People are very cautious about the claim. I don't know if I buy that still. Well, that's. I mean, like one of the results you said that no matter how bad you make your algorithm, on average, it's still the same. Well, I think that's the analogy. But what I'm saying yeah. is if you consider all the algorithms, for instance, maybe just you randomly pick a particular loss function as the S and then just try to use yeah. minimize that, then for that function, you're doing the best, right? Yeah, yeah. And what I'm saying is, this claim is that on average, if you consider the performance, all the algorithms will behave more or less similar because if, you're good, if you are good on this, you will be balanced by other instance, bad instances. But in, in and the same situation, I can probably come up with one that's bad in both situations. It's bad in all the situations, yeah, that, I feel. You know, like, I think there, well, of, of course, you, if, <laughs> if you say you can propose anything arbitrarily bad, that, that's, that, that's not a, the discussion. The discussion is mainly right. well, about you. All these algorithms are particularly designed, may, mainly focus on a specific subset of the problem. Right. And then if you say, because when you study the performance, you have to take the average. And the average is not on your design subset. Hmm. Then the most important theoretical work it says that when you do that, every algorithm looks very similar. Right. You cannot tell which one is better. If you are doing good on this instance, then you are 
guaranteed to do bad on other instances. And that's a very surprising theoretical result to me. I mean, at least in the last few decades, this no free lunch theorem, if you Google no free lunch theorem, about this Warpart and some other co computer theorists, they actually provided like this as like the theoretical foundation to justify, for instance, for optimization, there's no hope you can, by just doing Monte Carlo simulation and try to say, oh, I'm better than yours. Because that's just for your instance, for your pick the problem, it's not fair at all. But then what else can you do? All right, so, <clears throat> So let's see some real example. Well, that's not very real, but at least you see some setting. In general, it's hard by just looking at the measurement of z of k, you can say I can find the unbiased estimate of the gradient direction. And of course, so we have to come up with some simple linear model, right? Where that's the case. Okay, so let's say you have some unknown parameter theta where you have a linear measurement equation, z of k equals to h of k transposed to this vector plus what? Additive noise. And this noise may be zero mean Gaussian to make it simple, but in general, it doesn't have to be. It can be zero mean non-Gaussian if you want. And of course, the goal is to minimize the standard mean square error loss function, which is on average, your observation to your model, which is this h function, this is the inner product between your unknown parameter and your parameter set h of k. This basically, and your measurement, basically you use a linear parameter model to predict your measurement. You want the mean square error to be minimized. And in each particular instance, time k, you only have this q of k, which is what? Just the individual square error. You don't have the average, you don't have the average part yet. So what? So this, you can take the derivative with respect to theta, what do you get? If you have this Q and then you take the derivative with respect to theta, what do you get? This is standard quadratic function, right? And I just hope that when you take the gradient with respect to theta, you should know it will boil down to what? I'm sorry? Linear equation expressed like what? A ZK minus H trans HK transpose theta, and then what? And then what? H well, h, h of k transpose, right? Of, and, then the, and then this, right? So it's like a gradient vector with respect to, with respect to this. And that's basically this term. Okay, so you have a new measurement, and then the gradient direction would be this, where you don't know theta, right? So you put your previous estimate into that. And this algorithm, it's like what? Stochastic gradient algorithm. You put what? The previous estimate theta of k and the minus what? The gradient direction with respect to a step set A of k. And this is the gradient direction. Okay? And what's this algorithm? least mean square algorithm. So you already took, what, 65, 38? This is basically adaptive filtering technique. And why it's called a filtering problem? Because whenever you observe a new z of k, you sequentially update your estimate theta, right? Using a mathematical equation like this, right? And then in this particular case, you can say this, partic this part is just what? Approximate gradient direction based on what we said. And then of course in that case, we can say if your 
properly choose this k, a of k, in fact, this will convert somehow to the true value. But in this so-called least mean square filter algorithm, how did you analyze the convergence condition for the step size? So resting, are you the only student to taking 6538 adaptive, adaptive filtering? What about, what about Mr. Yu Liu? Did you take that course? Adaptive filter? <laughs> Okay, so so since you're so quiet, I'm just curious. Like in that course, basically, how did you? I don't think so. <coughs> well, do you do you recall anything about like in general, what step size you need to choose? Okay. Depending on what? The what? The eigenvalue of what? Mm. What matrix? But this is actually a simplified case of the actual linear model. In general, for a linear model, you have actually uh, like a H matrix multiply that, and then you have you have a vectored version of this Z of K. But here is just a scalar. So this, of course, is a simplified version of your least mean square algorithm. I would hope that when you look at the convergence condition for this A of K, in fact, what you learn in adaptive filter theory is actually more restrictive, meaning that it's, your condition is more relaxed than this. Here, I just say this A of K, the sum of this has to go to infinity, right? And then the sum of square of A of K has to be finite. But in your, in your analysis for least mean square filter, you can even make the step size more, going more faster to zero than it's supposed to be in some cases, provided the what the eigenvalue, and in this case it's actually it doesn't really matter because it, you have only one eigenvector with respect to you, vector h it doesn't really matter. So when you have this, when you have, for instance, this, all this, let's say if h of k are all identical, then you have what at least one positive eigenvalue for for this, then it doesn't really matter because the maximum value is one, so the minimum value is one, then this condition should be satisfied. That means, in effect, if this sequence A of K approach to zero even faster than this one over K, you could still get convergence. Anyway, so from this aspect, you can say at least by interpreting least mean square algorithm as a stochastic gradient descent algorithm, it's easier that you can recover a well-known adaptive filter. Any questions or comments on this example? Unfortunately, I don't know when this 6538 will be offered by my department. So, and also I have to teach two undergraduate courses next semester, so will not teach any graduate level course. So that's why, even though I would strongly encourage you to know more, but probably you have to find the right opportunity. For those who already learned that, I think it's good to see the, the connection from this aspect. Okay, so now let's look at how you train an artificial neural network. And in general, we only consider so-called feed-forward artificial neural network without feedback. And this is, in general, used as a function approximator. 
And you can say, well, we start from the linear model. Now we are talking about a nonlinear model where the output z of k represent by this neural network according to some standard nonlinear model. You can say this h of theta and xk plus some noise v of k. And this h is some function later I try to maybe use a flow chart to represent, but bear in mind if you heard about neural network before, that's not hard. Meaning that each input you get through some sigmoid function and then you activate with some weight, and then you combine those so-called neurons and then sum them together, you get this so-called nonlinear mapping. And that's actually a function of your input and some weights, which in general we can represent by a vector theta. And of course, this V of K is just the noise. And next slide, I will show the diagram of a standard feedforward neural network. But most popularly used, the training method is called what? Fab propagation. I think all of you heard about this before, right? No? Okay. Back propagation, which basically is considered to reduce what? The mean square error loss function between what you observe, z of k, and what you can approximate using your neural network. Okay? So you can say some people call that the energy function of all the of all the training data that you try to approximate z of k by a prop by, sorry, you try to approximate from x of k to z of k by appropriately tuning this data so that the error between your input out pair approximated by your new neural network on average is minimized. Okay, so now let's say what is the prop back propagation algorithm? I will say it is actually a stochastic gradient descent algorithm because if you think about it, this Q is what? Just for one particular observation, what the, mis the square error between what you observe and what the neural network of gave, provides you with this input, some output that the neural network provides you if the difference between the true output and what you can approximate using your neural network is large, then this square value will be large. And then you use this to, evaluate, to change your weights of the neural network by what? By the gradient direction, where it boils down to choosing appropriate step size, and then what? Change the gradient direction between your neural network and the output, and then this part will be propagated from the output to the input in each stage to change the weight. So that's why it's called the back propagation. If you think about, when you see some output, right, then we'll, what will you do? You will try to update these weights first, right, in stochastic gradient, and then what? These weights, and then what? These weights. So it's that's why it's called the back propagation. And if I go to the previous slide, in fact, each stage, how you update the weights is exactly follow this equation. So it's stochastic gradient descent algorithm. Does that work? Do you believe this will work? Well, now, now I think you guys are very cautious <laughs> when I ask a question. You always think the answer may not be very positive. Well, as a potential researcher, of course, you always go through some critical thinking process and try to challenge the existing belief. So that's why, for instance, you always ask such kind of question. Why you believe this method should work or should not work? And what might be the potential problem for doing this?
Well, if you look, if you are reading my slides, probably you won't find the answer. Yes. Yeah. Why you think overfitting is a particular issue? Now, because I try to narrow down my goal, I just try to mimic the input and output using neural network. I change my neural network parameters in order to fit some nonlinear function to the best extent, in this case, in the square error criterion. And I don't care about overfit. I'm overfitting that or not. OK, so. So I think it's in this context, I'm trying to just examine if this stochastic gradient descent algorithm has some potential problem. So I guess maybe the convenient way to say it, it works just fine because Everyone likes back propagation. It's in MATLAB, neural network toolbox. But remember, when we talked about in order to make sure that you get to the a good approximation to the true gradient direction, what requirement do we need? Unbiasedness. Okay. Can we say this is really an unbiased estimate of the, of the true gradient function? Assuming that this V of k, let's say, is just some zero mean Gaussian noise. Can you say this is a really unbiased estimate of the true gradient direction? So how many of you already took estimation and common filtering? Well, sorry about that. I think only Rustin and Mr. Yu Liu probably have a lot to say about that, about this question. You have no clue? Come on. <laughs> Do you think it is an unbiased estimate? Oh, you think it is not? It is. How do you know? OK, I take expectation, and then what? And then the only randomness comes from where? This measurement, right? OK, and what? And this part is nothing but the noise, right? You'll say, provided the noise is zero mean, then this part doesn't really matter. If this nonlinear prop proper this nonlinear part doesn't really matter. Okay, good. So, so what? So at least from that aspect, it it should work fine if we truly have an unbiased estimate of the gradient direction. But is there any potential problem? No. Is there any potential problem using this back propagation? No? Yeah, I assume so. Very good point. Because the best hope that we apply this the classic gradient is to what? To get to what? Some is to make this algorithm looks like what? Gradient descent without noise. Right? And that's it. 
as zero, it may stack into where? Some local minimum, or maybe converge very slowly if you gradient direction goes along a very flat hill of the objective function. So any suggestion to that? I'm sorry? Perturbation, okay, like what? Running simulated annealing or genetic algorithm. Well, most, most people wouldn't do that. I think if you look into the neural network toolbox, I think the most significant improvement is goes through what? Still local quadratic approximation. By, anyone knows? Anyone has the textbook on this, on this section? Yeah. Mm, not exactly. I think it's like close to approximate Newton step, but it has a name. Anyone has the textbook on the neural network section? You can find, for instance, there's a, a better approximation than the back propagation method. Yeah, like a stochastic to what to Newton method. Well, that's very difficult. That's why I brought this question up. Is there any stochastic version of the Newton's method? It's very difficult to design something like that because even to to show stochastic convergence on this type of problem, you need what you need to understand about a different type of convergence. Because this, we are talking about stochastic sequences. And there are different type of convergence. I think you know the difference between almost sure convergence, convergence in distribution, convergence in probability. You took this course, so you should, you have no excuse to. <laughs> Yeah, but there's a, like a strong version, it's like almost sure. Or you can say converge everywhere. And then there's a weaker version, like a converge in distribution. And then also you have mean square, mean square convergence. And then you have convergence with probability one. And in general, when we talk about convergence, it's in the strict sense, like almost sure convergence. And to prove that, even for this so-called Robbins-Monroe algorithm takes a lot of effort. And that's why, for instance, when you read any paper talking about stochastic optimization, you'll see the proof part is heavily involved with ordinary differential equation and also all versions of this, how to approximate some uh, perturbation equations based on controlling certain deviations of, the, of certain random variables so that eventually it will prove the convergence using all kinds of probability theory on that, on the approximation theory from that aspect. But with that being said, I would say it's very difficult, but still, for neural network, you still haven't found any improved version for the back propagation from the textbook. I think in the text, because I think some students ask me whether I should cover the optimization with respect to neural network, I originally I say no because it's a too broad topic. And also I say I said, well, it's hard to really find something meaningful that I can explain well on how neural network can be properly optimized. But now I use this as an example to show you in general, you can optimize with respect to approximating some nonlinear input output relationship by feedforward network using stochastic optimization technique by such as the back propagation algorithm. But there's a problem, essentially like what Nan said, but not about overfitting, it's mainly about the size of the parameter space and also you have too many hidden neurons that needs to be updated. It's very easily to be attracted by local minimum, like what Rustin suggested, can we approximate the gradient design by some Newton step type of Newton step, things like that. And then basically there are some proposed ideas along that line. In the textbook, I think 
there's one algorithm mentioned, just using some kind of introducing so-called momentum instead of just pure gradient descent. You still haven't found that? So this is the only textbook probably from the students who actually read. Wow. And also that's from the UNO library. <laughs> okay. I guess probably you don't value the this textbook a lot because like I I don't use the textbook very often except for assigning homework or computer assignment. I don't follow the exact sequence of my prepared lecture notes, but it does contain some useful information, I would say. Like especially like in neural network section, which I think in the new edition, I let me see. I should find it somewhere. Well. But I hope this section probably sh shouldn't be deleted in the new edition. Yeah, the back propagation. Yeah, like some improvement on the back propagation algorithm. You never read this part? Okay. Well, that, that's not really a good way to do theoretical design on that. I think the, the correct term is called the levenberg mcquart algorithm, which is, uh, I think, on page one. I think earlier than this neural network, I think it's now it's 165 or 162, which is actually a like a, a Levin, uh, I think Levenberg, I couldn't pronounce it right, Mac, um, yeah, McCart modification to the Newton step, and and that's the Newton step basically in being introduced as the so-called momentum to train the neural network, which if you explore the neural network toolbox, you probably will find that's the, st the state of the art to train the speed forward neural network. Is that a local well, none of these algorithms can actually avoid local minimum, but it, there's a hope, there's a hope it will convert faster. Right. If, and also if the local quadratic approximation is better than gradient direction, you get better performance, similar to comparing yeah. st steepest descent versus a conjugate gradient. Mm -hmm. uh, well, you can, yeah, that's why. That's why you probably need to reinitialize your, your, your weights a few times to make sure that they, you find the best training results from that aspect. Okay, so, so now, I think with this being introduced, now I hope that you get some picture about stochastic optimization, which is actually direct extension of the optimization technique you learned so far to uh, noisy setting. And how would that help when you think about <clears throat> in global stochastic optimization problem? Basically, we are not confined to just find what the local stationary point. There's a hope that we can still get to what global optimal by what? By some kind of heuristic in this case. Not, I think, not meta heuristic like simulate, simulated annealing or genetic algorithm, but this is still some heuristic you can think about if you inject some Gaussian noise like this, WK, to what? To your stochastic gradient recurs recursive algorithm where you can say this is, 
theta of k minus some step size a of k, and then this is actually approximate gradient direction. This is g you cannot directly get, so it's estimate. And also you use the previous value of theta evaluate this approximate function, which sometimes may not even be an unbiased estimate of your gradient direction. So there's no way you can tell even this converge or not. But then what? You introduce some random noise. And this random noise, basically you can say just use Gaussian noise by some Monte Carlo simulation. And the nice thing is about controlling this sequence B of K. Eventually, it will approach to zero, meaning what? Eventually, you trust what? You trust you approximate a gradient direction more than random perturbation. Of course, remember, this A of K also approach to zero anyway. So eventually, you don't perturb. And at the very beginning, you probably want to perturb randomly in addition to this gradient direction. How do I choose? I'm sorry? Because your design, you choose some sequence. For instance, if you say it's 1 over k, then that's your b of, b of k. You can make it slowly converging to 0, slower than a of k, which is, in practice, people recommend that. And the reason is what? Some kind of exploration, exploitation dilemma. Do you, if you don't perturb it adequately enough, later it's hard to, to get out of potential local minimal. And remember, this is not something like just pure intuition. Because remember, there's like a theoretical claim that simulated annealing, if you, what? If you do the annealing step slow enough, then eventually, with high probability, you will get the global optimal. A similar claim is made like this. If this BK approach to zero slow enough, then what? Theoretically, this will convert to the true theta, global optimal solution. But with that being said, still probably people won't be happy about that. Do you agree? Because you know, like in real engineering application, you cannot satisfy something like the annealing process is arbitrarily slow. And so still you don't know whether that's really a global optimal or not. But this is actually a good design in a sense that in a lot of real engineering applications, this design outperforms simulated annealing and genetic algorithms significantly. Do you know why? No. Intuitively, yeah, for, yeah, I think what Resting said is very important because if you can approximate the gradient direction, a simulated annealing doesn't use that information at all. And if that information helps you to quickly locate to somewhere close to the global minimum, then, then you should take the advantage of that. Yeah. And this does use approximate gradient direction yeah. instead of meter heuristic. Even though meter heuristic is better than random search, but whenever you can approximate the gradient direction, you should use that. And that's like the engineering moral, moral we probably want to always remember. If you understand your problem better, you can design your specialized optimization algorithm and perform better. And with that being said, I think the next thing we want to say is, what if we have a problem that's the discrete stochastic optimization? In this case, we th if we think about this approximate gradient descent, or so-called the Robbins-Monroe iterative algorithm, rely on what? 
this last function, the objective function, to be differentiable with respect to theta. And in many important problems, we only have theta taking values in discrete space domain, or maybe just integers. So in this case, what can we do? Okay, very good. So, so far, we oh, the only tool we have is what? Either, well, that's, that's already quite advanced. Either you do exhaustive search, which usually is considered not so efficient, or you do what? You do something like a branch and bound. Or maybe if you, if you can do another way to do branch and bound, it goes through so-called relaxation. You relax the integer constraint and try to solve the problem and then find the bound and then you enforce the constraint and try to keep a good heuristic on where to branch in order to reduce the exhaustive search part. Of course, if your problem happens to be very nice, you can do dynamic programming or you can do approximate dynamic programming, which I hope I can introduce next time. And also sometimes you can do greedy algorithm, which I try to, maybe I will introduce next time. And the reason you can do greedy algorithm and know that you are not performing very bad is because, for instance, your discrete domain has a very nice objective function similar to convex and concave. We have so-called what submodular sub property, and that's very nice thing that I mentioned last time. So these are things we can do. Other than that, I have no clue what can be done because. In general, discrete optimization from a computational aspect is harder than continuous optimization problem. Especially when you know a better way to specify your continuous function. In discrete case, the worst case, you have to evaluate your system to get the function valid, right? And in continuous domain, you have to provide something other than just say, well, that's the function. You, on, you can only assess from each particular realization of your continuous domain. In general, you have a better way to describe that, so that makes the optimization problem easier. And in this particular case, the major difficulty lies in how to estimate approximate gradient direction, which produce the descent information, although this gradient is undefined in discrete domain. Okay? But there are different methods to approximate the gradient part. Because for instance, if you think about a discrete domain can be approximated by non-continuous relaxed, con no, sorry, mm, how should I put? Non-continuous, non-differentiable continuous function somehow. Then you can still define some kind of gradient direction which is not very obvious to, to envision, but can you think about like you have some continuous function that's not differentiable, but still gradient direction is legitimate? I'm sorry? Yeah, very good example. And then what? For instance, any direction along the descent part would be good, right? Like the absolute value of x. Well, then, for discrete value, the, the difficulty lies in how to basically construct like a continuous relaxation where you don't rely on differentiable property. You rely on so-called subgradient direction, meaning that, for instance, like in your example, if you take absolute value of x, then subgradient direction means what? Something like any direction going descend not greater than one would, or minus one in magnitude would be good enough to go down, right, along the downhill. And that's basically how people do for non-differentiable relaxation. And there are associated methods with, with respect to this. One is 
called the cutting plane method. The other is called the bundle method. And I think maybe David once mentioned that he's interested in bundle method, which is not really my area of expertise, but I can only tell you just the idea of all these are based on basically how to make successive relaxation of the original problem so that actually you take the advantage of approximate gradient direction instead of blindly search. So with this being said, what can we say about the implementation issue on this? Of course, how do you control the perturbation from the previous value to the new value? Because now, whenever you propose a new technique, you want to show the convergence. And in most of these engineer applications, if you can show the convergence, you can definitely write a paper to any optimization journal or operations research top journal along this line of thinking. Any real engineering problem, if you can solve this great stochastic optimization and prove that nobody did that before, and that step really converges in some probabilistic setting, then definitely that's significant breakthrough. The problem is nowadays this becomes just theoretical exercise to prove the convergence because it's so hard. But the engineering relevance seldom take the advantage of any theoretical guarantee. Like, for instance, you just say, I don't care about you can guarantee the convergence or not. I just try my alpha k is just 1 over k, and it worked. And then sometimes Mr. Yu Liu maybe tried multiply this by some magic number 9.5, make it faster. And then that works for the engineer application, then problem solved. Other than that, there's no way we can definitely say how the algorithm works in a very concrete manner for discrete stochastic optimization. So with this, I would say that's pretty much the end of the story about stochastic optimization. Any problem? Uh, sorry, any questions? Well, a lot of problems. <laughs> 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 so, okay, sure. Yeah. But it's it's not linked because it's it's estimating a gradient using two points. Like a two point difference. Which which part do you think it is not? It's um the expected value of this, assuming that Z equals to that, when you subtract out this right. if you have the gradient direction, then it's just V. Assuming that V is zero mean, then in fact, this part is linear or nonlinear doesn't really matter. I think that's what Mr. Yu Liu just argued when you right. work on the neural network case. And here you have like the, this part in the, in the yellow box, you have this y is a k. That yeah. part, you have h k plus 1 times theta half of k. Yeah. Minus z k plus 1. Yeah. So this is using a, the estimate at a current point. Okay. The data points at the next step, right? Yeah. And yeah. Difference and it up the but even if there were no noise, that's not necessarily the gradient. Well, the unbiasedness has nothing to do with your estimate. It's assuming that you can calculate the gradient direction with respect to this term. Then the expected value sh should be just the gradient direction, which is actually without noise. Um, well, uh, can, can you explain one more time? Because I like, let's say that you have a function. Yeah. Of, like, relative to the linear. Okay, so um, <coughs> let me maybe switch to document camera okay. to see if I that. Well, <clears throat> I'm trying to write down the basically how to compute the grade, 
how to compute the gradient first and then try to see if that, that would work. And now you have, for instance, you say z equals to h transpose theta plus v, okay? And then let's say if you take somehow this z minus h transpose theta, let's say squared, and then one half of that. That's basically a function I call j of theta, right? And then the gradient with respect to j should be what? Uh, I'm sorry? Minus h transpose and z minus h transpose theta. Is that right? Well, this is a scalar value. It doesn't really matter where it appears. But the gradient has to be what? A vector in Uh, H is a vector, right? So, so H transpose, it, it becomes a row vector. The gradient is, in fact, a column vector. So, so it's better if you want, you can just, because this part doesn't really matter, right? And then this better eliminate this, just say it's like this, right? But this, because what? Because this z is actually something that's random, right? So your gradient actually is what? It's also random because of that. And then you'll say, on average, what would be my gradient direction? Can you do that? Assuming z is h transpose v, then this, for instance, on average, what, what do you get? On average, I'm sorry? Well, why is that? Because what? Z minus its transpose theta is what? On average, you are calculating what? Nothing but, because this H doesn't really matter, right? Then if this, if this V is zero mean, because the Gaussian knot doesn't really matter. Then this, in effect, is zero. OK. And what, what can we say about this? I'm sorry? It's Your z, z, z equals to h transpose theta plus noise. When you subtract out uh, h transpose theta, no matter what value theta is, this part will go away. Then what you have is just the noise. Provided the noise is zero mean, then this part should be OK. And that means what? The gradient on average is, is not, a, it's not bad, right? Because if it's zero. That's what you want, right? I hope this explains why the least mean square error filter works. Uh, 
And this is really a good question, though, because in, in other situations, it's hard to verify. Any other questions? So I guess we've covered most of the essential components of mathematical optim optimization techniques. Let me maybe just try to refresh what we talked about. We started from what? I'm sorry. Yeah, unconstrained optimization, like one-dimensional land search and what, like find the find the stationary point, take derivative set to set to zero, and then we talked about the gradient descent and also improved the version upon that. But we didn't get into the details on how to really solve like new <clears throat> unconstrained optimization using improved version like conjugate gradient or quasi-Newton or some other type of methods. But I think you did some exercise and gained some experience from that aspect. Then we talked about constraint optimization, but we didn't spend a lot of time in linear programming. We just directly get into what so-called necessary condition based on the inequality and inequality constraint, and then we talked about this quintile condition and also the constraint satisfac satisfaction verification on how you try to avoid the combinatorial problem somehow. And from that aspect, we also looked into when you try to change your optimization problem from the primal to the dual one, sometimes there's always a benefit of looking at the dual problem because what sometimes you may reduce the problem into smaller size, you may decompose that into small sub-problems. And then we looked into so-called non-local algorithms, which are based on meter heuristic. These are some people call global search methods, including simulated annealing and genetic algorithm. Um, and then what? And then we looked into well, some discrete problems, including what discrete stages where your, optim your objective function can be decomposed into multiple stages. Each stage contains some sub-problem where you can control the complexity, like what dynamic programming, which solves a lot of discrete optimization problems. And also we, talk we looked into another type of nice discrete objective function called the submodular function and talked about if you can identify the problem that's in this category, then you can do efficient, you can find efficient algorithm to solve submodular min function minimization problem. And then we extend this idea to what? Stochastic setting where you say, I don't have a reliable way even to assess the objective function. I have to observe noisy measurements of the objective function, but I still want to minimize this noisy objective function somehow, then we introduced the well-known stochastic version of the gradient descent method called the Robbins-Monroe iterative algorithm. And from that aspect, we also see the connection between adaptive filtering and some other neural network training methods to this stochastic gradient method. Also, we said that this could also be extended to like a Newton's method with some careful design of your iterative step size, and also a version where you artificially introduce random noise, which in general can be even better than simulated annealing or genetic algorithm. Whenever your gradient approximation is good, then the, this design is usually better than pure simulated annealing. Um, 
with this being said, then I guess if you just want to crush everything into like one optimization course, probably I've done my job, then of course you may say, well, should we just relax and uh, work on the term project or maybe some unfinished computer assignment and homework assignment and then the final exam and relax? Probably I, would, I wouldn't say so. In general, I want to <clears throat> give you some picture on, for, for instance, as a real engineer, what you may encounter when you have some field problem or research problem, which could be formulated as optimization problem. From my perspective, when I look at the problem, first is about how you formulate the problem. If you can formulate it as a linear program, even though maybe you introduce additional variables or additional constraints, it's usually better than what? Nonlinear optimization problem. If you can make it a convex problem, it's better than non-convex problem because you know with convex property, you can find efficient algorithm to get to global optimal instead of search and run. Okay, with that being said, then of course in real life, what can you do? Well, I would say we can do a lot. There are different ways to, to solve the problem. One, of course, is to know a lot about the theoretical part, which probably in this course I wouldn't offer too much from the mathematical aspect to make it so rigorous that will scare most of you because of the, like the theorem proof style just to show that an algorithm works in terms of convergence or convergence rate or things related to some mathematical net property. On the other hand, we do need to gain some good experience using optimization toolboxes. And in, in small scale problem, you can easily gain some good knowledge by exploiting MATLAB optimization toolbox or design your own small routine, which I think some of you did a very decent job and try to even provide me some nice source code on how to write a modular function. For instance, Rustin, I think, already provided me like his thoughts on how to program some modular function for MATLAB, in MATLAB. And those are good practice. And of course, you have also the luxury to explore some other cutting edge optimization tools like CVX with a considered a good academic version free convex programming software. Well, I mentioned that because for instance, some, some software may not be free like AMPL, AMPL package for mixed linear integer programming is not free, it's commercial, but you can have educational license to have a trial run for small scale problem. And there are some other commercial optimization softwares that you can easily explore, but not until you formulate the problem to some extent that you say, I have to use some global optimization algorithm. You probably don't want to do that until you tried your best effort to reduce your problem to something that cannot be tracked, cannot be resolved using no efficient algorithms. For instance, in continuous domain, I would say any problem you can convert that into what convex optimization, you probably should do so. Any problem, if you do a self deal decomposition, try to find efficient routine that can do that, in general, you should always try to decompose the problem to the best extent and try to use this Lagrangian duality theory to improve your good solution somehow. And then for discrete optimization problem, if you already exhaustively looked into all the means of decomposing your objective function, tried dynamic programming or maybe submodular optimization, which doesn't work, then you settled that it has to go through some tedious, maybe branch and bound or meta heuristic optimization algorithms. Then of course you can do that, but even in that domain, you need to take the advantage of maybe some specific problem structure where, for instance, maybe you 
can change your annealing parameter with respect to your problem setting to get a more efficient solution close to optimal one, hopefully, rather than just blindly <coughs> apply a commercial package or some optimization toolbox to the problem that you have. So that's basically my view on why this course is very practical and in general what you need to know. Any questions? Okay, and then I guess maybe you are curious about what will be the plan for the rest part of the semester, right? And my tentative plan, of course, would be just to introduce more about cutting edge optimization tools or techniques that you may be interested in, or somehow maybe you don't know the technical details, but at least you know the basic idea. Whenever later you find some research problem that fall into this category, you know where to locate the references, or you know where to do the Google to read the Wikipedia or whatever. And that's one idea. Of course, another idea would be just you guys suggest something that if I may, I try to prepare something towards some special needs and what you would like to see. And I can have a combination of this. What I plan to do, for instance, next time, I plan to introduce like a greedy method, which of course is albeit, it's albeit very simple. And for those who are from this information system research lab, they probably already heard my previous talk on this subject before, but you probably can get better feeling when you have a background knowledge of optimization to appreciate why greedy algorithm works in some very nice engineering problems and why we can show theoretically that it has guaranteed performance close to the optimal. It's considered a very good, efficient, suboptimal algorithm. And then maybe I will talk a little bit about, I think next lecture will be um, either geometric programming or semi-definite programming, which is something like the original problem is not convex program. But after some nice manipulation, you can make it a convex program including second order cone program, which is considered a very useful tool, like even for the course project assignment. If you can use this CVX package, you can easily handle the optimization with respect to over 60,000 variables very easily. And that's the nice thing about using convex program package instead of exploring some global optimization technique, which you can, but probably won't really get good solution to that problem. Okay, and then I guess eventually we will have this stage or yours on the project report and the present oral presentation. And we probably need two lectures for the oral presentation, even though I think the one lecture for all of you to do the oral presentation would be very crowded and also very time, very time consuming. So I tentatively think if anybody is willing to do the oral presentation one week before the last week of, this, of the semester schedule, I would like to know that information so that I can have my schedule more or less flexible. Okay, so <clears throat> that's basically my plan. Now, I guess I just want to hear some feedback one is about like how you want, how you envision like the term project or how you would like me to, to cover in the subsequent two or three lectures. And also maybe some other suggestions you would like to make. I have a, maybe about 10 to 15 minutes if you want to add anything. But, well, the sparsely pursued, I will cover that when talking about the greedy algorithm. That's actually a very important application, especially recently when we try to solve optimization problem where we want to find sparse solutions, where for instance a vector contains only very few non-zero entries is considered sparse, and we want to find sparse solution, satisfy some constraints, and that I will cover in greedy method. Any other suggestions or questions, comments? Anything you think that might be worth mentioning before it's getting too late?
Yes. Just an observation. A few people use the term target to put online. When it comes to presentation, won't it be a little bit redundant? I'm sorry? If you, let's say if you want to put your work online and then also you, you think that maybe that can substitute the presentation, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say so. Well, I mean, if like five of us use the term project that you have on Blackboard. Okay. If five of us present the same thing, won't well, if, if, well, I would say if five students all work on the assigned term project, if you decide to work as a group, then you can present like as a group, as a whole. On the other hand, if you decide to work independently, and sometimes you may come up with different solutions or different results, then I wouldn't recommend that we reconcile this into one presentation. Of course, the later presenters could take the advantage of shortening the background material, but that's probably now a lot of time, re I mean, time reduction in terms of the whole presentation. I would like to see like how you really solve some engineering, engineering challenging optimization problem in your own way. Of course, you can take the advantage of online resources, software package, or maybe your research experience. But I would like to see some interesting optimization problems first. And then also maybe some good solution, heuristic, or maybe even rigorous pursuit on how to improve the optimization algorithm. Okay, so maybe let me put a question in a different perspective. How do you feel about the course material so far compared with what you envisioned when, at the beginning of the semester when you take this course on optimization? Is it very different, too challenging, too easy, too... I mean, like, what perception you have so far? It's, it's not easy, okay. And I'm sorry, you, you think this is too mathematical already? Okay. Yeah. Okay, so for, of course, for different people, like maybe Lippi may like a lot if it can be put in a rigorous mathematical setting somehow. And then, for instance, Bryce probably doesn't want to get involved with too many mathematical manipulations. Well, it's, it's always, I mean, there, there are different flavors in this course, I hope. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I partially agree with your statement because, for instance, if I don't introduce that, if you say because that's adaptive filtering, you have to learn that in order to appreciate this, then you don't see engineering connections. On the other hand, even if you have no clue what is unbiased estimate, I hope in my class at least you get some first-hand feeling what, basically what, it, what it is about, why that's important, even though it's not mathematically that rigorous. I hope that also motivates some of you to take some electrical engineering graduate courses because without your support, we cannot hold graduate level course without adequate enrollment, without enthusiastic pursuing in research in excellence. So that's why I'm promoting, even though I'm not going to teach those courses, but I, I value the materials provided in those courses. Like I already mentioned, the probability and stochastic processes estimation theory, adaptive, adaptive filtering, 
And maybe I should also mention detection theory, which is considered the core of this. And then also, of course, linear system is considered the foundation to understand about the system and feedback. Mm, no, I think Dr. Jokov is teaching this semester, so we probably cannot offer repeatedly next semester. So there are so many elements in this, uh, so many elements in this uh, So many elements, okay, that's a very interesting comment. Just, uh, well, I want to, yeah, okay. I want to. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I also can construct structure the problem in such a way. But basically my approach I think is slightly different from the layout in the textbook. Because the deficiency from the textbook lies in the aspect first is doesn't really challenge you in how to model the problem adequately. Like in my case, I try to at least provide, in the early stage, provide some engineering examples to show you, for instance, how the description of the problem can be written rigorously as a mathematical optimization problem and where to make trade-off. And the, another aspect is that this textbook focuses too much on continuous domain, like the continuous de decision variable and unconstrained optimization without touching discrete part too much. But in real engineering applications, I would say 90% of the computational effort are dedicated either to linear program or mixed linear integer program, which is considered a discrete combinatorial optimization. So what do you think if you want to get out of this course? You don't want to know anything about discrete optimization? And that's basically, I have to compromise a little bit. And also another aspect is that, for instance, the global optimization techniques are not really well structured because there are so many techniques available which I don't consider, I don't value them a lot. I value those great mathematical thinkings in optimization. I think at the very end of the lecture, I will try to provide my perspective on how I structure the optimization, which I think you probably can find some other trees of the optimization online. Like I have a colleague, Ms. Uh, Professor Japan Wu from University of Florida. If you go to his website, he has a very nice structured version of mathematical optimization, all the theory part, all the application part. But that's worth looking at, but still, you have to come up with your own thinking in order to apply this to real engineering problems. Well, as a, as a very end, I will try to provide that, but I don't want to influence all of you too much about my perspective, because I think it is better that I just provide you adequate background information for you to decide where to explore, because this is really a whole branch of mathematical optimization theory with a lot of potential applications. Depending on where you want to go, I think I should highlight some important landmarks. Similar to, for instance, when you visit the US, I can only pinpoint to some cities I like, for instance, ask you to see if you want to visit San Francisco, for instance, I would say maybe you should go to some places. Or maybe if you want to go to Seattle, I will try to recommend some other alternative. Other than that, of course, maybe you like New York City better. Then that's a different story. But still, for instance, I would say it's similar in some spirit I want to introduce some common theme in the mathematical thinking of how some engineering optimization problem should be tackled in a systematic way. Anything else? Okay, so I guess that's pretty much for tonight. We don't have any new homework due at this point, but I think we 
we do have new assignment on Blackboard, which will be due next week. And also, I, I already received some, CS, uh, some project proposals from, from a few students. And if you plan to do your own project topic, I would like to see some one or two page description of your project so that at least I will try to see if the problem is well formulated and provide some timely feedback to those of you who decide to maybe work on your own assigned project. In addition, even if you want to choose the term project that I posted on Blackboard, I would like to see, for instance, how you want to address the problem. If you can ask some questions and start working on the problem, that would be nice. Okay, so I guess I will see you next week and then we will have spring break. <laughs>